Good afternoon. This is Jeb Blunt. I'm the CEO and founder of uh, SalesGravy.com. And today is a delight. I have the opportunity to introduce one of the top speakers and authors in sales in the world. And uh, Nancy Blakey is one of my very, very favorite people. And I came on today specifically for this particular webinar so that I'd have the opportunity to, to, to tell you about Nancy. Now, here's a couple of things that you, you'll want to know. She's, um, she's got all kinds of, of awards and recognition. She's been named one of the top 50 sales and marketing influencers. Um, Buddy CRM says she was a top blog for 2015. Um, she's been named a top 100 most innovative blogger by I See It. Um, she's uh, been given the top 20 best B2B sales blogs by Ring DNA. And I can keep going. There's just one accolade after another after another. And her book, Conversations Itself, is one of my very favorite books. Um, Nancy and I are kind of dive from the same cloth. We wrote um, books that are about human relationships and, and, and how you interact with people. And you know, when, you, when you listen to Nancy speak, you're not going to just you know, see a person who's telling you to do things. You're going to find a person who actually walks the talk. She does the things that she says and teaches you to do. And the thing is that I can say all these nice things about Nancy, but probably the nicest thing to say about Nancy is that this is one of the most genuine, authentic human beings that I've ever met. And to just spend time listening to her teach you and train you, you're going to be mesmerized by the, the information that she gives you. And the one thing that I want you to pay attention to is that she's going to teach you, we were just talking about this before we started the show, that, um, that as a salesperson, as a business person, you don't have to change hats when you're talking to your customers. You can be an authentic human being, and that's what your customers and prospects want. And so I'm really pleased to, to, to introduce you and to hand the, uh, the webinar over to one of my dear friends, uh, Nancy Blakey. Thank you so much, Jeb. And, and as you said, we're, we come from the same cloth in our philosophy of how we need to sell. And so um, thank you for inviting me to talk with the audience about conversations that sell and how we can close more sales by being genuine and collaborating in conversation. So hello, everybody. I'm so glad to be here. And you know, you've signed up for this webinar. And to remind you of what we promised to deliver you, we, um, it's up on the screen. And uh, it's, we're going to how to stand out and truly differentiate yourself from the competition. It's not as hard as I think some of us make it. We're going to talk about that selling is just a conversation and why that matters, why you matter and are the real reason prospects buy, which ties into Jed, Jeb's book, uh, People Buy You, and how to structure unforgettable sales conversations that add value to anyone that has the privilege of having that conversation with you. So we do have the chat um, function open. If you have questions throughout, please post them. But I'd like to try to make this interactive, which is not so easy when there's hundreds of people on the call. But there's different times that I'm going to pose a question or ask for input. And I encourage you to use those fingers on your keyboard and type in the chat box. And I'll work with that information along the way. So. Um, there's a lot of people on the call. You're from different industries. You have different styles. You're selling different things. And you know that is what is so great, I think, about careers in selling, is that there's lots of types of selling out there. Um, we have you know, still door-to-door -door salesmen, uh, or salespeople, but there are a lot of salesmen. Uh, we have phone sales. We have retail sales, real estate. We have agriculture. and we still have the used car salesmen. Um, and actually, I had a really good experience and collaborative conversation with one of them last year. So to help me understand who is on the call, if you would, use the chat box and tell me, you know, what is it that you sell? What industry are you in? And then if possible, I'll weave in some different references or context points throughout the webinar. So um, go ahead. You know, what is it that you sell? What industry are you in? And, and write that in the chat box. Let's give it a moment here to see what comes in. <clears throat> okay. Let me see. 
All right, Carrie, if I'm not seeing anything, oh, here we go. Okay. Transportation industry, business solutions and technology. Okay, great. Um, so keep those coming and I'll, I'll look at them as we go on. So there's a lot of types of selling. And, you know, when I think about working with the groups that we work worldwide for all of these years, you know, we work in a lot of different industries. And no matter what the industry, there are definitely something that's very common to everybody. Um, and that is what is selling really? What is selling at its core? Um, what is it that we are doing when we are selling? And, and years and years and years of working on this, um, about three years ago, I had this aha that we're making selling too difficult. That selling is simply helping someone else do or decide something. So it's helping someone else make a decision or take an action on something. And, and what makes it challenging, depending on the type of sales we're in or the industry or who our customer base is, is that we're helping them work through their decision process to make a decision or take an action. And, and that becomes challenging because we all have a sales process to follow, or we should have, and we have to align that real time to make it valuable for them and for us. And so, you know, this is what selling really is. And, and if you think about it, we all sell. And we all sell all the time, whether it's selling a product or service where we're getting paid for it, or we're selling ideas, or we're selling um, people taking a, a commitment to something. Any of you that are parents, friends, spouses, we're always trying to help people you know, make decisions. So if this is what selling is, you know, what are we trying to accomplish by this? And, and so often I would hear salespeople talk about the fact that you know, they're kind of not important. Um, even though they do all the work, it's about getting the best profit or sale for the company, it's about doing right by the customer, and that often we're stuck in between, and, and we're sacrificing on one end or the other. And I believe that when we're looking at selling, we need to look at winning as more than a win-win. We need to look at it more comprehensively so that all the stakeholders involved win. And so selling um, needs to be what we call the win-win-win or the win cubed, where that customer has to win. Otherwise, they're not coming back. We're not going to get referrals, um, and you know we're going to you know not do very well. The company, of course, needs to win because if our company isn't growing, isn't profitable, there's not going to be the products or services we provide or jobs for us. Um, and then we are one of the stakeholders too and we need to win. So these are you know, the three stakeholders involved in any selling transaction. Now of course, each of those might have multiple people in them. There's going to be many people within your company affected. You might be selling to groups, so there's more than one person that represents the customer. But all in all, you know, these are the stakeholders that need, need to win and need to succeed. So the question becomes, how, how do we do this? How do we use our opportunities with our customers um, to, to help everyone win? And so much time and attention and many, many webinars and experts focus on how to do that lead generation, how to do prospecting. You know, we're going to talk about how do we, once we get in front of that person, whether it's telephone or face-to-face, -face, how do we maximize that time with them and really move them into making a, a decision? And so how do we close more sales? It starts with our mindset and preparation. And then I'll get into the specific skills and how-tos. And so the first thing that I'm going to throw out there that is very often controversial is that we need to ditch the pitch. And I know a lot of companies have their pitch books and they teach the pitch and all of that. But if you think about what a pitch is, and we're still in baseball season, so you know when we have an opportunity to pitch something at someone, what are their options? So, you know, go ahead and use the chat box. What are someone's options when they have something being pitched at them? Okay, so we can catch it. We can 
bat it back at them, and we can even duck. So those are our options when something's being pitched to us. So when we're talking with someone, we don't want them to feel that they have all these options, um, that they can throw us a curveball, they can throw it back at us, they can duck and try to avoid it. We want to engage them. And we engage them if we start with the mindset that we call the with it, because what they want to know is, what's in it for me? So if we start thinking from the very beginning and positioning everything into what's in it for them, the words that come out of our mouth and the engagement is going to make it a better experience. They're going to have a better um, uh, feeling of being involved, and they're going to give us more time, attention, and sales. And so we want to, we call this, again, it's the with it. So, you know, acronyms help us, you know, keep longer um, strings of words in mind. So we want to start with ditching the pitch and instead in worrying about what are we going to pitch to them, what are we going to pitch at them, we want to focus on, you know, what's in it for them. And here's the, the, the kicker. If you cannot identify what's in it for them, why someone should want to talk with you, then you shouldn't be trying to have a conversation with them because it's not – it's not going to be, you know, relevant. It's not going to get you where you need to go um, or help them in any way. And so it starts with thinking about does what's in it for them, ditching the pitch, and getting beyond the fact that you're making a call or that this is a transaction or something to check off on your spreadsheet, that we need to think about having conversations with people. Um, and that, that other party is a person or it's a group of people, and they don't want to be talked at. They don't want to, as, as um, Jeb was saying, go into this autopilot, robotic kind of approach. Um, instead, they want to be engaged. They want to be part of it. And the more we can make them part of it, the more successful we're going to be in making them forward or moving them forward. So it's conversations, not transactions. It's conversations, not sales calls. And if we think about engaging in conversations, we're going to get more time and attention. So um, we need to make the conversation what it is, and that's supposed to be two-way. So we need to get beyond that, you know, this is a contact, and instead make it a conversation that is relevant and value-filled. And that is how we're going to move things forward. So when we look back at, you know, how do we achieve the win cubed where the company, the customer, and us always win, one of the ways of doing that is starting with this with it focus, thinking about what's in it for them, ditching the pitch, focusing on what's in it for them. So that's the first thing. Now the second thing is um, how many of you have been through consultative sales training or read about it or know that that's the approach you take? Go ahead and you can, you know, write notes about that. Okay, so, yep, it's, it, it, consultative selling has been around for a long time. I actually was a, a facilitator um, of it for many, many, many years. And, and I started noticing in the late, you know, 2009, 2010, that buyers today, and everybody knows this, are busier than ever. They have more responsibilities. They have uh, less time. They have more um, challenges in getting decisions through and getting budgets. And so they are harder to get the time and attention for. And so the last thing they want is someone coming in and consulting, which they might consider telling them what to do or trying to get them to do something that maybe um, isn't top of priorities for them. But more importantly, today's buyers have more information than they've ever had. And I just heard on the radio this weekend that you know, how much information is created every year. And it is mind boggling. So part of consultative selling is that we're supposed to educate and we're supposed to be the expert and help them, you know, get the information they need. But today's buyers have a lot of information and we have to be able to respect that and not waste their time with information they already know and we have to honor the information they have and work with them in a more collaborative approach where we're in it together. So collaboration and collaborative are words that we've been using um, in our 
training and solutions for years. But I've noticed in the last two years there's even some commercials where they're talking about collaboration or collaborative approach. And so it's one of those words that become a buzzword that we have all different meanings to. And so what is collaboration? And, and the dictionary says that collaboration is to work one with another and to cooperate. How many of you love it when your buyers or prospects work with you and cooperate? I mean, that is like nirvana in the selling world because we know we can get a lot more done. We can help them at a higher level. We can get decisions made more quickly. And we can get them our product or service that much more quickly too. Now in this definition, I love this bottom line that says to be in cahoots because to be in cahoots with somebody kind of means you're an insider. You're kind of in it together um, and, and it, it signifies some kind of, um, I don't know, get, you're not getting into trouble, but it signifies something very different than being this you know, consultant. And so that's what we want to do. So what is collaborative selling? It's really working side by side with your buyer to achieve something you both want. So you do want to sell. You need to sell your product or service to succeed. But you know what? If they're talking to you, they want a solution to something. And so the quicker that we can get them to that solution, the quicker we get the sale and you know, the quicker we achieve that win cubed. So the trick here though is that we still, like consultative selling, need to be the expert. We, we need to have the information. We need to know, hopefully, more than they do. We need to study up on our industry and trends and what's going on and know our product or service inside out. We need all of those things, but we need to use our expertise differently. And so the, the term I use is we need to use our expertise expertly. And that is a skill that is, you know, a different level of proficiency in being able to what I call right size everything we're doing in our conversations. And we need to right size the information we're sharing. We need to right size the time we spend in the conversation, the messaging that we give out, and the type of relationship. Because not everybody is looking for a new best friend. So some people take relationship selling too far. Relationships are important. Relationships are how we get things done. But what buyers, whether you're B2C or B2B, want out of the relationship can be very different. And so we need to be able to right size all of that to that person and that situation. And so that's more what collaborative selling is and sets us up for ongoing conversations. So going back to this win cube, we've already talked about we need to achieve the win cube, be with it focused, everything should be focused on them, and we need to look at it as collaborative and bring in our expertise and be able to right size it and make everything that we talk about with them relevant. And now I'm going to talk to you more about how do we do that specifically from the beginning to the end of a sales conversation. And so <clears throat> before we jump into how do we start the conversation, it's you know keeping in mind that we need to skip the assumptions and instead focus on the short view and the long view so that we make every conversation matter. So sometimes our sales are one conversation and we have a decision and we go on. Other times we might have 8, 10, 12 conversations over the course of the selling process. But each of them, you know, needs to be focused on them being collaborative and not letting assumptions keep us from having a dialogue where we're constantly checking in with them to find out where they're at now, what do they know, and only take their time and attention with the level of details and information they need to know. So that's the, the foundation. Now, how does that work in a conversation? So, you know, you have to think about every time you're in contact with somebody um, uh, that we need to answer some questions that they have in their head. And so most people, when you have, whether you even have a specific time set with them, you know, they're busy, they're not just sitting there waiting for you, it's who are you? Why should I talk with you? And who is this about, you or me? Are you coming here to pitch something at me? Or are you here really to try to see if there is anything that you can help me with and I should be talking to you? So, you know, that's the kind of conversation or the questions that they have. And we need to very quickly at the beginning of our conversation answer those questions so that we can move forward in a collaborative conversation with them or qualify them to find out that they're not 
going to be a potential, and we can move on to higher probability contacts. So um, we call this the three-step start. And when you look at this, it's going to be like, well, duh, this is easy. But I can tell you from the number of uh, calls that I listen to, the number of field rides my team goes on, and the evaluations we do afterward, that people do not start conversations concisely. They do not start them with a focus um, and an agenda and getting everyone on the same page. But more important is that when we consciously start a conversation, we help that other person break their preoccupation and help them start focusing so that all of our time together is relevant. So you're going to mix these pieces up depending on whether you know the person, um, whether it's a scheduled uh, conversation or not. But we do need to let them know in a greeting who we are and use our name and our company name. We need to explain the with it, why should they talk with us? Why are we asking them for 10 minutes, 30 minutes, 60 minutes? You know, what is in it for them? Um, and even if the time is scheduled, we need to reconfirm, you know, we scheduled this time to discuss fill in the blank, you know, what else do you want to make sure we accomplished in this time? But we right away show them, hey, we're in this together. Here's what I think we're doing. What is it that you want to make sure we're doing? And then we need to ask questions and get them talking right away to, again, show them it's not about me, it's about you. So we need to confirm time, which is a huge disagreement among sales experts on if you ask for time or ask if this is a good time, if they say no, then where do you go? And I tell them that and say, if they say no and I try to move on, how rude is that and how much attention um, or respect or future conversations are they going to want to have with me? So we need to confirm time and then we need to, you know, turn into an ask questions where we get them talking. And the whole purpose of this is to help us earn the right to move forward in the conversation or in that right sizing, identify now is not a good time, let's schedule another time that's going to work better for you. Because we want not only their time, we want their engagement, we want their participation, and we want their willingness. So, you know, that's the whole purpose of making sure we're ready and that our, we're not multitasking, our preoccupation is broken, and we're ready to focus on that person and that situation. So by earning the right, then we move forward in our conversations, and we've done our preparation. We try, we try to figure out whatever we can know about them so we don't waste their time. And if you can find out something on a website or LinkedIn profile, you know, don't ask those questions. Instead, you want to confirm them. So we want to go into then investigating and finding out um, information that either confirms something we already know or opens up their mind to discovering some things that they might not have been aware of, you know, regarding their own situation. And so I have on here investigate or interrogate because too often um, when people go through training and they start really, you know, oh, yep, I need to ask better questions, I'm kind of shortchanging that and jumping right into my, my product um, information, that we start firing off very direct and leading questions that suddenly becomes an interrogation and we kind of put that person on the defense or they feel they're really being led or sold to and they start shutting down and not wanting to have a conversation. So instead, we want to you know, ask some questions that are open-ended and then make sure that we're doing that good listening and pausing enough for them to actually respond. And this is where I believe a lot of salespeople don't take control of the conversation um, and instead they're so busy trying to drive it um, that they, they lose sight that sometimes a pause or a paraphrasing back is not you giving up control of the conversation, it's you actually slowing it down to get the information out that allows you to have a conversation with another person. So this is also where a lot of people say, this is where you need to look for the pain. You know, look, look for that pain that you can help, um, help them with or look for the wants or needs. And so all of those are important. I believe we need to look for more than that. If we really are going to collaborate and bring solutions that, that, that stick, that um, are, are bigger than just this one-time sale, we need to look for problems, opportunities, wants, and needs. And so here's another acronym 
problems, opportunities, wants, and needs. We call it the pawns. And so our questions need to help discover, you know, are there problems that they're having? Maybe there's not. And you know what? We can't always sell on problems. Some of us have to educate and help people see that there's opportunities to do something better, to save money, to save time, to increase efficiencies, to you know strengthen how they're doing marketing, whatever that might be. And, and we can't ignore that that might be what we need to be talking with them about and asking questions to see if they understand there is an opportunity for something um, to do differently in their own you know, work and own company. And then, of course, we do need to look for wants and we do need to look for needs. And there's a difference between wants and needs. And years ago, I posed the question to a group and I said, all right, from your experiences, what do you see as the difference? What's a want and what's a need? And this woman very quickly said, you know what, I need a car but I want the red convertible. And so that's a big difference. You know, the need is the must have, the want are emotionally driven desires that often are more compelling than the, the need. And, you know, I like to say that uh, many people will um, substantiate or justify a decision they made very logically and with facts. Um, but they've made the, mo the they've made the decision emotionally, and that even holds true with B two B sales. I have seen over and over again um, buyers make decisions that you know are not you know the best pricing, um, are are not the best terms, are maybe not even the best solution, but there was some emotional component that made them go that way. It might have been the salesperson, it might have been. Um, what they think it can do for them as far as positioning within their own company, lots of different things. So we want to look for these pawns in our investigation. And then before we move on in the conversation that sells, we need to do that qualifying. Uh, we need to make sure that we're spending our time with our high probability buyers. And so before we move on to start telling that person how our product or solution can impact and help them with those pawns, we need to um, make sure that they are the decision maker, that they have the budget, um, and then we need to confirm with them that they're willing to hear how we can help them. And so too often at this point, as we're doing our observations of sales conversations, the salesperson assumes that since that person talked to them, that they're interested in hearing what they have to say. And instead we have to confirm, well, here's what I understand. Um, do you want to do something about that? Can we spend time now with me um, sharing with you how I believe we can help you with that problem, opportunity, want, or need? And by getting that permission and that confirmation, we're much more likely to continue to have them engaged with us um, and collaborate with us as we get into the part where we do need to educate them on what we can do and how we can help them. And so qualifying and confirming is an important part of a conversation that sells. And then once we have that, then we can make it easy for them to see how what we have matters to them and their situation. So we need to think beyond data and details. We need to think beyond features and benefits. And we should everything that we explain, which I call it a what, you know, what do we have to describe? We need to immediately connect it to a with it. So we need to connect everything into what it means to them. And if we can't connect a specific feature into what it means for this person, then we don't have to waste their time telling them about it. So for example, here's a little thing you can do with yourself. Is every time you're thinking about explaining something, and you can do this with your emails, and you can do this verbally, you know, think about, okay, here's the information I want to explain, and then ask yourself from their perspective, so what? So what does that mean? What does it mean to me? Why should I care about that? And so instead of saying, you know what, we, you know, our solution provides 24-7 support, which, okay, fine, nobody's listening, you know what, our solution provides 24-7 support. And just like you told me, um, sometimes when the first shifters come in at 7 a.m., the system is down and they have to wait till 8 o'clock till the IT department gets in. Well, with our software, at 7 o'clock they're going to be able to get on with our support and they're not going to lose that time waiting for the IT, so you're going to save an hour a day. 
it's a very different way of letting them know what that 24-7 support means specifically to them and starts getting them thinking about the value. And what happens, I think, in selling is that we, we memorize or we understand our product so well that we make assumptions that they're going to get how that connects to them. And I think that we can be lazy in that way, and instead we need to make that connection, which will ensure they understand that connection, and they're going to better identify the value um, that, that is there. So we want to explain anything that we give with a what's to with it, and you can use that so what test to yourself to make sure that you have something compelling to add in there. And if you don't, then you shouldn't give them that piece of data. So, okay, so along the way, you know, we talked about how do we start. You know, we should ask questions and look for problems, opportunities, wants, and needs. We should qualify and confirm. And we should connect anything that we talk about into what it means to them and the value to them. So, you know, that's a process of, of you know, conversing um, and conversing to sell. Now, in a perfect world, great, we move into the close. But, and you know what, reality, we are going to hear maybe concerns, a challenging question, or a downright objection to something along the way. And at that point, we are going to show who we really are. We are going to show, you know, if we're just uh, collaborating with them or if we are now going to start, you know, trying to uh, manipulate, avoid, etc. And so often, what happens when we hear an objection is that physiologically we go into a fight or flight reaction. It's what our body does. We either want to minimize it and get over um, to something that feels safe to us, or depending on who we are, we want to we want to take that on and we want to defend why that information is, or why our price is this, or why you know the timing is this. But instead. If we use an early life lesson that most of us learned either in elementary school or in preschool, um, that when our clothes are on fire, what are you supposed to do? You're taught that if your clothes are on fire, you're supposed to stop, drop, and roll to put out the flames. Well, when we hear an objection, no matter when it is in the conversation, it might seem that we're under fire, and we can use that same philosophy of stop, drop, and roll to work through those concerns or objections and to keep that conversation, that collaboration, and that sale possibility going. So the first thing we need to do is when we hear um, the concern or objection is we need to stop. We need to Oh, it's moving on itself. We need to stop and pause and listen to what they're saying and not start talking over them. Then we need to drop our assumptions, our agenda, our emotions, and our ego. So those are two things mentally. We need to just take a breath, focus on them, and listen. Then the first words out of our mouth is how we roll forward. And we need to acknowledge that objection. Here's what I hear saying. Or, you know, it's my understanding that this, you know, is a, is, is, um, something that you're questioning, and then ask for more information around that before we respond. We need to slow that down again and take control by keeping it interactive, keeping it a conversation with another person, and often it's a problem to be solved. It's not an impasse. It's something that we can work through with them. Um, if we set it up right, but if we take the defense or we try to avoid or minimize it, we're probably not going to get very far. So um, as a bonus, we have this uh, free ebook that will give you more about stop, drop, and roll and how to safely work through objections, and the, the URL is right there. So that's an extra bonus um, for you for that one specific piece. So once we have um, started our conversation, asked questions, confirmed and qualified, uh, matched our solution, worked through any objections, then here is the key to closing sales, and it's going to seem so simple, but it happens fewer times than it should, and that's that we need to finish the conversation. So a close is getting a decision or an action, but we need to make sure that they're ready to make that decision by checking for decision readiness. You know, do they have all the information they need? What other questions do they have? Um, does this make sense to them? Do they see how what we've talked about is going to solve one of the problem opportunities or we, uh, wants or needs that they discussed earlier? Then we can one last time say, you know what? 
what, I, what we've talked about is going to help get you here. It's going to help you tackle this. It's going to solve this problem for you. And then we can ask for that decision. And that we see in the um, conversations that, that we observe and, and rate that 50% of the time conversations are ended on assumptions of what's going to happen next versus a specific decision or commitment asked for and responded to. So if you want conversations at close sales, there's a lot of pieces along the way. But we need to make sure that we end the conversation with a specific decision or commitment. It sets the expectations for what comes next and allows us to keep them moving through their decision process and us moving through our selling process. So that is the flow to a conversation that sells. And we can be 17 to 25% more effective in our conversations if we've done our, prop, our, our preparation. And so we did some closed studies within some of our clients. We took you know, different teams who had the same product, the same number of people, the same marketing initiative going on at the same time. And one group we left alone, the other groups we had um, the manager and the people in the teams agree to consistently prepare for all of their conversations. And they were 17 to 25% more successful during that time than those groups that did not prepare. And so when you think about the simple act of preparation, you know, most of us know it's important, we know we should do it, and we still don't do it. We don't get into that consistent practice or what I would call a discipline of consistently preparing that's going to lead us to 17 to 25% growth. So Think about your sales, think about your quotas, think about your income. What would you do with even a 17% increase in that? Is that compelling enough to you to take the time to prepare? So what do you think are most people's reasons why they don't prepare? So, all right. Time. That's what I'm seeing, okay? So time. So we need to think about preparation as not extra time. It's what I call a transfer of time because we have also proven that for every minute you spend in preparation, you will save that much time or more in that conversation or in that selling process with that buyer. That if it takes you 10 minutes to prepare, you're going to be that much more efficient that you'll save more than 10 minutes in your follow-ups, in the conversation itself, et cetera. And so um, it's, it's getting ahead of it and using your time differently. So take the time up front, make the time up front, and you'll save the time later. So preparation is so important. Um, to achieving this win cube that's with it focused and collaborative. So, so far we've talked about, you know, a lot of things that are skill based. It's how we do something. And when we look at top performers and people that close sales, you know, more often than people that don't close sales, we, we know that it takes skill and it takes the will. And the skill are the things that we just talked about. We can teach them, we can observe them, we can evaluate them, um, and, and they're important. They're an important part of being successful in selling. But when you look at top performers, they've got this will. They've got the internal drive that they you know, put into getting things done. They will take the skills that are given to them, the tools, the resources, the mentoring, the coaching, and they will make the most out of it to be successful. And you're going to hear from Cheryl Franklin of UPS in a little bit, and, and she, before we got on this call, I had mentioned to her that, you know, she's been so successful, and, and she right away said, well, I've been very fortunate to get this, and, you know, get this training and get, you know, the opportunities at UPS. Um, but, but Cheryl, it's not just about what UPS is giving you. You have the will to have used that information to be successful. So this gets into the how important are you in your success? How important are you in the success to yourself, to your company, and to your, your customers, clients, buyers, you know, whatever you call them? And that not forgetting that along this whole way, even though we're being with it focused and we have to make sure everything's relevant to them, even though we want to be collaborative and work, you know, together with them, you matter. 
you matter a lot of that sales opportunity to your company. And how we can make sure we matter and bring our best to the table is something that Jeb Blunt mentioned at the very beginning, and that's being genuine. Um, that we can adopt really good practices, we can adopt good tools, we can adopt good resources, but then we have to do the extra work to adapt them and make them ours. We have to show up as our best you with every single conversation, and that's how our conversations are going to sell, that's how we're going to close more sales, that's how we're going to build longer-term relationships and a referral base and a career um, in selling. So going back to this win-cubed model, um, conversations that sell, you know, win for the customer, the company, and you. And we do that by being genuine, adopting and adapting best practices, and showing up as our best self every time, by being focused on everything from start to end on what's in it for them. And if we can't figure out what's in it for them, move on. And by being collaborative, using our expertise expertly and, and doing this alongside them, honoring the information they know, honoring the um, experiences that, that they have, and, and their expertise as well. And when you put that together, you, you, know, you win. Everybody wins. So um, you know, engage with a focus on with it to begin. Educate by right-sizing your data and details. Gain commitment to decisions and actions at the end of every conversation, and you'll speed up your sales cycle um, and, and get more sales made, and then be you. So that's winning sales, conversations, and collaboration. Um, please do type in chats. We're going to hear now and um, turn it back to Carrie from Sales Gravy. But uh, we'll be happy to use our time in answering specific questions that you have. I already mentioned Cheryl Franklin from UPS is on um, the line with us today. UPS is sponsoring this webinar. We have a synopsis of her very um, prolific uh, background and successful background. And Cheryl, the floor is yours. Hi, Nancy. Thank you so much for the introduction. Can you hear me OK? Yes. OK, good. Um, so thank you to Sales Gravy for giving me the opportunity to kind of talk a little bit about my journey with UPS and my past history. Um, and actually, probably the most interesting people find about my career path is the fact that I did come from a well-known financial um, company, which is J.P. Morgan. Um, I went to school for finance. I worked in the financial industry really my entire career and kind of made it into J.P. Morgan, which is the private sector, and really thought, you know, this is it. I've made it. I've had goals. I've achieved them. And once I, once I got in the environment, I just... It didn't quite fit for me. Um, I had a lot of ambition. I wanted to move up quickly. And, and once I got within the organization, it just seemed like it was going to be a little bit too slow moving for me. So I started asking around. I started doing some research. You know, If I'm going to make a career jump or make a company switch, I really wanted to be smart about it because it was quite a risk. I was 10 years into my career, so I wanted to make sure that I made a smart decision. And I actually found out about UPS from one of my friends who was working as a senior account executive, um, which is in sales. And he talked about UPS and talked about how he started as, out as a loader, worked through college, and then came on board to the business development department and, and started his career in sales. And he talked about the legacy and the culture and really encouraged me to do my research. And I thought about it, and I said, a transportation company? Like, what do I know about transportation? That doesn't really seem like that would be fitting with my personality. And the more I really dug into it, the more I saw it's not really just a transportation company. It's really about a technology and solutions company. And there's so many different facets to UPS where I thought, well, if I'm going to make a career switch and I'm going to hop over to another company, I, I want to make sure there's enough opportunity there and there's enough options. And when you look at UPS as a whole, it's, it's not just about moving packages. You know, yes, we have our operations, which is a huge part of it. But that's just one component of what we do. We've got our sales department, which is uh, business development. We've got marketing, industrial engineering, finance. Uh, we've got international opportunities because we are a global company. So as I did my research, I said, OK, this looks like if, I, if I'm going to make a jump, this seems like the smart company to go with. So I took a leave of faith, and I made a career switch. And I started out you know, entry level. So started out just feet to the ground. I was a sales and service rep. Um, quickly did that, um, became an account executive. So I got a little bit more responsi 
responsibility, my account base grew. And really, it was once I got comfortable with myself, got comfortable with the industry, got comfortable with um, some of my mentors and guiders, UPS really wrapped their arms around me and said, we see potential in you, and we're going to get you the help you need to be successful. If you'll work hard for it and you'll put in the effort as well, we'll make a successful team. So UPS has really given me the tools I needed in order to be successful. Now, to Nancy's point, I feel like I've used those tools really well, but I can't tell you how grateful I am for the, for the growth and the development that I've experienced throughout my career because of the focus that UPS uh, gives me for that developmental purposes. It's also about opportunity. We, I've got a unique opportunity with UPS because there are so many different projects that they work on, so many different things to get involved with, that it really helps you build up your skill set, not only with the current role you're in, but through other projects. Um, we've got CRGs, Women's Leadership Development, um, which we're heavily active in. It's really encouraged. It's about the development of women in the workforce and making sure we're, we're retaining that talent. We've also got a new BRG that we started for the millennial group. So how do we attract and maintain the millennials? How do we really focus our culture and efforts into to mold a little bit more to the millennial style? Um, so I've been involved in that project as well. And those are really the the opportunities that you get with UPS and the opportunities that they that have been given to me that have really helped me develop my skill set beyond just the day-to-day -day job. So that's a little bit about my um, history with UPS um, and my career path. And Great opportunity you have at UPS and um, I, I believe you have careers open for people to look into as well. So. Um, if anyone is looking in between careers, UPS. We are ready for questions. What more do you all want to know based on what we talked about regarding closing sales through conversations that sell? We do have a question from Lynn who says that um, um, going through, let's see, he's going through office managers to get two doctors for final decisions and needs to get the doctor's attention, which is the biggest challenge. Um, depending on the office managers, um, he's depending on the office managers to convince the doctors and can really lose impact. So uh, it seems like the question is how to get around that maybe. Yeah, um, Len, if you would type more about what is the question that you'd like me to respond to regarding that. I, I want to make sure I talk about the right thing. I see and there's another question about what should we do to plan or prepare. So I'll tackle that one first, and Len, if you would give us more information on the other one, that would be helpful. So preparation and planning, what should you prepare? I believe you should map out your, your conversation. You should map out, you know, what is the objective? What, what do I already know about this person, or, or what should I find out? So, you know, is there a website I can go to? What's in our CRM? depending on where you got the lead from, uh, can I find them through a LinkedIn profile? You know, what can I find out that's important and relevant uh, for this person and situation? Then how am I going to start and be very purposeful on you know, that three-step start? What is the reason that they should talk to me and what is the objective that, that we're going to cover? What are the questions that, that should be asked to discover more about their pawns? Uh, if, I, if I know I'm going to be explaining something, what are the data and details that are relevant for this person in this situation? And so you know, often we might have nine talking points, but we only have to focus on three of them because that's what's going to matter to that person. And we see that over and over again that when we talk about the few things that hit what we discussed as far as pawns and their priorities, that we don't have to give the rest of the detail to move to the, to the next step. Um, we just have to verify that they're getting what they need. And we can prepare for what are the objections we think we might hear. Okay, if I think I might hear that objection, in that moment, how can I ask for them to clarify more about that or, or to you know, dig for the root cause? Or what is something I can do early to minimize or avoid that conversation from the very you know, from the get-go. Um, and 
what's the decision I'm looking for or the action I'm looking for at the end. So it, we, we call it the five-minute quick prep. You can map out your conversation in five minutes. The key is to put it on paper and not just think it through because when you put it on paper, it's committed more to your memory, and then in the conversation, you can be more present and be in the conversation and adapt um, and adjust back to you know, what's happening in that conversation knowing that you have a road map. So that's my thoughts on preparation. Perfect. Um, I see a, a really good one here from Doug, and he's asking, how do you have a conversation with a disgruntled person? Um, it just moved up. Dis disgruntled person to get past it onto a, a better path. That's a really great question. Wait, can you repeat that, please? Sure. How do you have a conversation with a disgruntled customer to get past it in, into a better path? How do you how do you get um, okay? I, so I think that that's a lot of stop, drop, and roll. Um, and and actually, we do a full course for a financial service company that's working through uh, difficult conversations. And you know, the disgruntled people often have a lot of emotions and intensity involved. And we need to listen and help them. So we need to listen to what they're saying to us. Then you know, respond back and say, okay, so let me you know. Let, let's make sure that I'm hearing what you're saying. And when they know you're listening, it ramps down the emotion and, and intensity a bit, usually. Um, okay, so if this is what I hear you saying, um, you know, I, I want to help, you know, through this, or, you know, we're going to work through this together, or some sort of intense statement that lets them know that, um, you're not going to avoid or minimize it, or you're, you're not going to give it the importance that they think. And then you can move into asking for some questions. So, well, what, what, what happened in the past? Or, you know, have you had this problem before? And we can start doing some triage and getting more information so that then you can present, well, here's what we can do. And it's been found, there's a great book, um, I'm looking at it, I gotta find it right now, about uh, the customer experience and that their experience in working through something when they're disgruntled, um, is more important than the actual outcome or solution. So even if the answer is no, or you know they can't get what they were looking for, or you know the the problem can't be resolved, if the experience and how they were treated was good, they're going to be a happier potential customer referral base afterward. But if they do not feel they've been heard. Um, if they do not feel that there's been an attempt to, you know, approach something, then, it, it, you know, you, you can't uh, recuperate from it. So I think the book is called The Customer Experience. It had great data um, and research done on the importance of that experience. Perfect. Okay. Um, we have another one from Sherry. Um, she wants to know, uh, she says, where can I find the C-level decision makers? I belong to numerous networking groups, but I don't see a lot of C-level decision makers there. Because they're really busy and don't go to those <laughs> networking groups. Um, okay. So I, you know, I, I think I said earlier, there are other experts that focus more on the prospecting aspect and how to get to the decision makers. Um, and so I, you know, there's a couple of really good books, uh, The Sales Magnet by Kendra Lee. Um, I'm trying to think. Uh, Jill uh, Conrath, Selling to Big Companies, is about getting to the C-level people. You know, those might be some good resources for you. But um, my experience is that C-level people don't have a lot of time to do networking functions. Okay, good. Um, and then here's here's one from Ryan. What's the best approach to reconnect with a prospect that we that um, has been lost? To another to another company. Yeah, it's to not not give up. If they're qualified and there's someone you want, and that's I think something we first have to ask ourselves. You know, are they still somebody that's worth the you know uh, continuing on? But we need to nurture them. And so for this morning, for example, someone I've been trying to get in touch with for five or six months, I, I sent him a note today, and all it said was, you know, hi, it's Nancy again. If nothing else, I am persistent. You know. <laughs> 
when can we get the conversation? And then I just put a link in there to my calendar and said, you know, I, I look forward to that. And it actually got a response this morning. So um, some of the things that uh, we want to do to keep nurturing people that maybe went on and made a decision to buy from someone else that we still want to stay in front of is, you know, come up with your plan. How often do you want to stay in touch with them? And then mix it up with phone calls, emails that are of value, something very short, maybe an article that's relevant to them, um, something you've learned about them along the way, you know, reference that. But come up with a multi-mode approach and, you know, whether it's every month, every six weeks, just keep them, you know, keep, you know, nudging them so that you're still in their mind if things go bad or they want to talk to another potential supplier. Okay, very good. Um, another question is, you talked about uh, conversations um, not ending them on assumptions. And so yeah. what kind, tell, tell us again what kind of specifics um, to do right there at the end, because I certainly have noticed um, uh, with salespeople that they do tend to make assumptions and then you ask them about the next step and they don't know. So what kinds of things um, <laughs> would they, should they try to get specifics on? Well, they should try to get specific on what's the next action each of you is going to take. So, you know, are, are you following up and providing a document or setting a calendar appointment or this? Um, are, are they, you know, committing to make an introduction to somebody else? Um, if they say, yeah, 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 let's schedule time in a few weeks, it's saying, okay, why don't we, while we're on the phone right now, let's get that scheduled now. You know, get that confirmation as specific as you can before you end that conversation. Um, and, and so often, you know, we hear something positive they say, and we're like, great, so you're going to, you know, yep, I'll send that off to you. And, and we have taken the responsibility to do something, but what have they committed to do? So they're going to open your email, but are you expecting them to read what you're sending and then do what? So the more specific we can be in those next actions, the better the expectation is for what happens next so that when they receive something, they know it's coming, they know what they're supposed to do with it, um, and then you've got to, of course, be sure to follow through on your commitments that you've made. Um, and I find um, right after the conversation, if it's possible, to send a short email, not just saying thank you for the time, but you know what, here's the two key things I heard in our conversation, and here's what we're doing next, boom, 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 that so few people do that. I know that my team personally has won several nice size deals in the last six months because of us taking that extra time to be that clear, here's what we learned, here's what's coming next, um, and that kept us moving forward in the process. So, Very good, yes. Not I'll, ending in a <laughs> Yes, I like that, that's great. Um, I, th I think that's, that's it for now. Um, I want to, oh, you know what, I wanted to, uh, there was one more that I saw just a moment ago um, about, can you share just a little bit about how you prepare um, for a meeting? I can. So I, I use, we have a, it's this five-minute quick prep tool, and it outlines the conversation from beginning to end, and I put notes in there. On the back side, then, it, it, it'll prompt me to, you know, what re, you know, where did you go to look for information? So, you know, the website, the CRM, whatever. So that prompts me that, and I'll copy and paste things out of the website if it's a, a, a new a meeting. Um, I also have this app now. It's called Charlie. I don't know if anyone's heard of that. And so for any meetings that I'm having, it gives me any recent um, information on that person or the company that they're with. So like this morning, I got, here's your Charlie appointment, you know, here's Charlie, here's your appointments for today. And for each person, like for Jeb, it had a link, and I could see his latest blog post, I could see the latest note on sales gravy. And so it lets me see what's going on right now that I could possibly use in initiating that discussion um, and connecting with them to earn the right to move forward. So my preparation is, it is. It's a doc. It's a document that I type into where I think about the objective, how I'm starting, what are the questions I want to ask, what are the concerns I might face. So, and then how am I going to stop, drop, and roll, and what's that decision I want at the end of it? 
Um, some of them take me five minutes. Some of them take me 30 minutes because I have to do more research on, on, on things. So that is our discipline in preparing. Great. Okay. I love that. Love that. I have to check out that app. Um, so I want to... I want to um, thank you, Nancy Blakey, for being our presenter. You've done a fabulous job, and um, uh, we are so grateful and privileged to have had you on today. Um, I would also like to thank UPS and Cheryl Franklin for being with us today, uh, and I would like to thank UPS for the sponsorship. Um, thank you to our fantastic Sales Gravy audience for joining us and taking time out of your busy day to listen to us. Take care and look for notifications for our next Women in Sales webinar next month. So happy selling, everyone. Have a great day.